Hello again, everybody, and welcome back to video lecture number two for Introduction to Games for Learning. Today we will be discussing, by which I mean I will be ranting about, reward mechanics in games and in other interactive systems. In particular, I'll be talking about gamification, the use of individual game design elements in non-game contexts. But the design elements I plan to bring up apply just as much to full immersive games, and in many places we don't generally think of as being game-like or gamified at all, like classrooms. The focus of this lecture is at the mechanical level of game systems. So just to review, here is the working definition of mechanics from last time. Mechanics are the systems which take player inputs and convert them into outputs in the game. Mechanics are the foundation of all feedback in games, which in turn is the foundation of decision making. Studying mechanics is absolutely fundamental to bringing games into your instructional design process. I don't care what you actually plan to do or what guild you want to specialize in, whether you're adapting commercial entertainment games or using serious edutainment games or creating your own gamification design. Whatever you're doing, you need to be able to identify and analyze and criticize mechanics because that's how you understand the feedback that learners are receiving through your system. So, if mechanics are so important, why is this lecture titled Pablum? First, if you don't know the word, Pablum originally meant plain, finely ground porridge, and more specifically, it was food for babies, or people who could only eat a very simple, bland diet. But over time, it acquired a second meaning, which has become the dominant meaning today, as a word for entertainment or activities that are bland, unchallenging, or childish. In other words, the mental equivalent of baby food. And while I will always reject the idea that video games as a medium are all pablum that's rotting kids' brains and have to be tightly restricted, I do have to admit that there are a lot of pablum games out there that have very little redeeming value other than that they are easy to keep playing on your phone until 3 in the morning, despite not really being all that fun. So why do we do that, and why do designers make those games? You may already be familiar with the idea of a Skinner box. B.F. Skinner was a behaviorist psychologist who did experiments with rats and pigeons where he would put the test animal in a box and hook up some system where they could get a food pellet, or in the more intense experiments, a tiny dose of cocaine, by pushing a lever, doing some other action or series of actions, with the goal of creating a long-term behavioral change through positive reinforcement and actually training the animal to acquire new behaviors. So that's where the term was coined. In game design, a Skinner box is a game that is built around delivering a steady stream of those little rewards, only instead of food pellets, they feed the player with points and levels, little hats for their avatar, or in short, with pablum rewards. And they do this because, very simply, it works. If you design something to deliver a regular dose of pablum rewards, you can keep a surprising number of people engaged enough to keep playing your game for a very long time. There's a little tiny thrill we get from seeing some gold coins go into our account or seeing a level counter increase, and it's even better if we get something a little bit tangible like a sticker or a pizza party, even if what we did to get there was not all that challenging or interesting itself. And if the goal of the design is just to get you to spend time on the game or go through the motions of finishing the activity, then just setting up that drip feed of pablum rewards is an easy, straightforward, and effective way to do that. And a lot of well-intentioned plans fall into this trap, where the goal is to help people somehow, to develop good habits, or connect people with each other, or help them learn. But the design relies on these extrinsic rewards to do it, and the result winds up being that people go through the motions just enough to earn those rewards, and the moment the rewards run out, or something that's mildly more fun comes along, they just drop that pablum game and they never go back and their behavior reverts to baseline. 
The inspiration to call this the Pablum model of game rewards comes from Scott Nicholson, who has written and presented extensively about gamification for learning, specifically in libraries and museums. And he coined the BLAP acronym for gamification rewards, encompassing badges, levels, achievements, and points. These are all extrinsic rewards. They're not actually a part of the activity itself. They've been slapped on after the fact, hence the blap sound. And Nicholson's main conclusion was that blap rewards can create moderate levels of engagement for as long as the rewards keep coming. But the moment they stop, that goes away, and the intrinsic motivation for players to continue, the desire to keep playing, keep going, just for the enjoyment of the activity itself, can actually drop lower than it was before. For example, did you ever participate in that Pizza Hut reading rewards program in elementary school where for every 10 books or whatever you read, you get a free kid-sized pizza? It's still going on today. Well, it turns out the kids who already liked to read or didn't dislike it could get free pizza, and that was great. And when they aged out of the program, they by and large continued to enjoy reading as much as they did before. But kids who started out with below average reading motivation, who didn't like to read, would do enough to get the free pizzas, but then when the program ended, or they aged out of it, their long-term reading motivation actually dropped, because now it was something they never found particularly enjoyable for its own sake, and now they felt like somehow they were getting shortchanged if they read a book and they didn't get rewarded with pizza. It turns out that poor use of game mechanics and feedback systems is not only just kind of bland and uninspiring, it can actually be harmful to learning. So you can read Nicholson's work for yourself in the next couple of levels, but while Nicholson's focus was on identifying design goals for gamification that could produce sustainable positive effects for motivation and learning, meaningful gamification, my goal here is to dig deeper into how these reward mechanics work and see whether they can be used in more productive ways than just as simple extrinsic reward systems to basically bribe people into playing along. Even if you never go on to do anything with gamification yourself after this course, it's important to recognize how some of these common game mechanics work how they get used, and what kind of feedback they actually deliver to players in games, and how to intervene and redesign those feedback loops if necessary. So Pablum is an update of Blap, where, as you can see, I've rearranged the order and I also added two more mechanics for the U and the M. And in the next part of the lecture, I'm going to go through each of these and explain them in more detail and offer some examples of how they appear in different games and some suggestions for how they could be used in the foundation of more nuanced learning design that will actually be fun and engaging on its own and not have to rely just on extrinsic rewards. There's kind of a lot to unpack once we start down this rabbit hole, so it turns out that this lecture is just part one of three. So I'll be talking about points in the second half of this video because those are kind of the basis of everything else. You can frame all of these other mechanics pretty much as just specific uses of points if you wanted to. So there's just kind of a lot of uh, points to cover there. Then in part two, I'll go over the achievements, badges, levels, and leaderboards, which are all mechanics that are used to create and track progress and objectives, and together these form a layer of persistent feedback that can extend beyond the boundaries of the immediate game environment and can carry over in various ways from one game to the next. Then in part three, we'll look at unlocks, upgrades, and mana. These are the two new mechanics that I've added onto the model, and they are both ways of controlling the decision space of a game and balancing the player experience between intrinsic self-regulation and external regulation. So that's the roadmap. If you need to hit pause and go hydrate or something, go ahead and do that now, and then come back and we'll talk about points. Okay, welcome back. So obviously I don't need to explain the concept of points to you. You 
already know what points are. We use them everywhere, all the time, especially in education. But for the sake of clarity, when I talk about points, I'm talking about any system that produces a number value as the result of a player action. That's it. And that sounds like a very simple idea, and it is, but it's a very powerful one, and it's important to learn to look past that simple veneer and actually see what points are doing in a design. Points are a powerful idea because once you take a decision or an action and turn it into a number, now you can do math at it. And indirectly, or sometimes directly, you can do math at the person who made that initial decision. And as the man said, with great power comes great responsibility. So if you are going to go around doing math at people, and you are, if you're grading anything, I really want to help you do that responsibly, because it's definitely possible to mess it up and do damage if you're not paying attention. So there are countless ways to do different things with point systems in games and deliver feedback for different purposes, but I want to talk about just two examples today of ways that you can design or redesign points mechanics to give different kinds of feedback and allow you and your players or students to make different kinds of decisions. First, we will look at accumulation versus attrition in scoring or gaining points versus losing points. Then we'll go over linear versus exponential change. Do your inputs and outputs stay the same over time, or do the results change over the course of a game and push you to change your approach as well? I could talk about a lot more examples of specific uses of points, but these two are directly relevant to a lot of instructional design and the way that you are already probably using points for scoring in your classrooms. So in the interest of keeping things relevant and keeping this lecture under three hours in length, we're just going to stick to these two today. So first, let's talk accumulation versus attrition. Very simply, you can use points to give feedback either on gains or losses and highlight decisions that were successful or decisions that fell short. In an accumulation system, the main form of feedback is players gaining points when they do something right. Both of the games in this level use accumulation scoring. Prodigy, and especially Cookie Clicker, are all about gaining points. Watching those numbers go up, that is the primary draw and the primary form of feedback. Accumulation is also how most team sports are scored, which keeps things exciting because, at least in principle, even if one side falls way behind, they can always turn it around and keep scoring and win in spite of their past mistakes. Yes, I am a Patriots fan. No, I will never stop mentioning the 2017 Super Bowl. It's a great example of this principle. Accumulation scoring means that even if you have made mistakes in the past, even a lot of mistakes, you can always make up for it and keep scoring more points and ultimately be successful in the end. Then attrition scoring is pretty much the opposite. Here you start out with full points and lose some every time you make a mistake or fall short of the objective. Health bars are a great example of this in fighting games or other competitive video games, where your goal is basically to hold on to your health points and get your opponent to lose all their points first. You also see attrition scoring in target sports like darts or bowling, or judged sports like gymnastics and figure skating, where there is a maximum perfect score possible in each round, and a player's performance basically boils down to how close or far from that perfect score they get. So high-level play in fighting games and bowling and figure skating and other attrition-scored games is much more focused on risk management and consistency, because if you make mistakes, then there's no way to make up for that. You just have to hope your opponents make bigger mistakes on their turn, or you're automatically going to lose. Now, most games aren't purely one or the other. You can have both accumulation and attrition scoring in the same game. 
They can be nested inside each other in RPGs like Loop Hero here, where the overall trajectory of the game is to gather different resource points and build up your base, accumulation style. But within that, the individual expeditions and battles are attrition style, where you try to knock health points off the enemy monsters without losing all of your own health points. I would go so far as to say that most video games do both to some extent in different parts of the game, but generally you can class a given game as primarily attrition or primarily accumulation in terms of the overall play experience and which numbers actually determine the result of the game in the end. So in this course, I've tried to create an accumulation style scoring model where your score is always going up visibly when you check the grade center and it's always possible to earn more points and even if you make a mistake you miss something or you fall behind it's pretty straightforward to just try again and keep building that score up and up and up and this is in contrast to the traditional academic scoring model the 0 to 100 scale which is unfortunately a nutrition model if there is a predefined maximum score of 100 that's possible in a class or a marking period or whatever, and the only way to get there is to avoid mistakes, turn everything in, and more or less perform perfectly all the way through, that's attrition scoring. So just to make it a little less abstract, let's say there's a student who gets 85 points out of 100 on an assignment. Now there are two ways to present that and feel about it. One is that they have 85 more points than they did before they handed in the assignment. They've gained points and they are closer to their goal, however that's measured. But the other way is that they have lost 15 points they could have had and there may or may not be a way to get those points back and they may feel like they are further from their goal than they were before even though they've actually done more work. That's attrition. Now, is that bad? Personally, I don't love it, but there are some useful qualities to scoring a game that way. Attrition scoring tends to reward consistency and a lack of significant mistakes. Fans of figure skating know that usually the gold medal is going to the skater who is the most well-rounded on all the fundamentals and makes the fewest mistakes in their routines even if other skaters might have individual strengths or moments of brilliance that outshine the winner. And if that's a goal of your design, if you want to reward well-rounded students more than students with a wider range of strengths and weaknesses, then this can work. But if you want your students to be able to use their strengths to make up for their weak areas and maybe come back from behind to ultimately succeed, like in a football or baseball game, then attrition scoring isn't going to let them do that, and you need an accumulation model, which is obviously my preference. Sidebar, I bet that when you signed up for this video games course, you did not expect that I would be philosophizing about figure skating in the lecture. <clears throat> okay, let's move on to another way to think about using points mechanics for feedback. Linear versus exponential change. This distinction is all about pacing and change over time, which is often expressed as a progress curve, or as you may be f more familiar with it, a learning curve. So in this case, the way we are using points to define these different curves is as you move through the game or the lesson unit or whatever from beginning to end, are you getting points at a steady rate throughout or are you getting more points as you go along or are you getting fewer points? And these three possibilities will determine whether you want to keep making the same kinds of decisions or you want to update your strategy over time to account for the change in pace and the new feedback that you are receiving. So the first case, obviously, is linear, where the same action or decision has the same basic result and the same basic value at any time during the game. And what a linear progress curve is doing is rewarding the player for picking a strategy and sticking to it and executing on it well. 
The traditional academic scoring model is linear, which makes sense. Mostly we want students to do assignments at the beginning of the term and still be doing assignments at the end of the term. And those assignments will generally be similar in nature, so they are worth similar points values. And any game that's designed to encourage players to perform the same basic actions repeatedly will also have a roughly linear progress curve in terms of points earned for doing the same thing throughout the game. But there are other ways to design this curve. A classic example is the experience and level progress curve in RPGs like World of Warcraft or Pokemon. When you start out playing one of those games, you will level up very quickly at the beginning. You can probably go from level 1 to 10 in a couple hours at most. But as you continue, you need to spend more and more experience points for each new level. And so you have to spend more time working towards that goal, and you have to move through the game world to find new challenges that are worth more XP. You can't just stay in the starting area at level 40, slaying the same wild boars you did when you were level 1. So this is an exponentially decreasing curve, the way I've plotted it here, where you need more and more points for each incremental step of progress through the game. And consequently, the pace of play slows down, at least in some regards, as you go along. Then the reverse case, the exponentially increasing curve, would be a game where things accelerate as you get closer to the end, and you see your key numbers suddenly jump higher and higher towards the end game. Competitive online battle arenas like League of Legends do this, where high-powered weapons and abilities take a lot of money and experience points to unlock. So the early game is played at a fairly steady pace, usually, while you build up your resources. But then when you pass that threshold to unlock your endgame abilities, the pace of play accelerates very quickly, and it turns into a whole different, much faster kind of game. So you might be saying now, that all sounds very interesting, but what does it have to do with learning? Well, like I said, there's not a lot of variation in this regard in the way we track progress and pacing in education, but that doesn't mean there couldn't be. Let me give you an example from this course. I've set up a linear progress curve with the XP and level system, where you need 100 XP to unlock each level, and that's true throughout the course, at the beginning and the end. And I did that for the reasons I already discussed. But I could have done things another way. For example, set it up so the first few levels unlocked very quickly, say every 40 to 50 XP, so you would get access to a lot of course material and a lot of options in the first couple of weeks, but then the rate would decrease, slow down that curve in the second half, so that the final levels take much more work to unlock than the early levels. And with the levels being tied to final grades, I could make it so it's actually relatively quick and easy to get to a C, but then the distance from a C to a B is further, and the distance from a C to an A is much further than the initial distance just to get from the start of the term up to a passing grade of C. And I have done that slightly in this course, where the grade steps between C- minus to B+, plus are linear all the way up through level 8, but to go any higher than that you need to complete a masterwork project, which is a significant bump in the amount of effort expected to get up that final level or two. Alternatively, I could have curved things the other way, where progress is slower and flatter at the beginning, and it takes a lot of effort just to unlock those first few levels and pass that threshold at all. But once you do cross that line, it's pretty simple to get all the way up into the A range from there. A lot of so-called weed-out courses, like in pre-med or engineering or whatever, are curved this way, where it's difficult to reach that pass point at all, but if you do pass, you're basically guaranteed at least, say, a B+. And, once again, many games will have both linear and exponential point systems to control the pace and the feel of different aspects of play. 
Cookie Clicker is an interesting example because the game itself is all about exponential increase and making numbers go up faster and faster and faster. But the costs of new buildings and upgrades are also increasing exponentially, which pushes the pace of play in the opposite direction and slows progress down. But that also gives extra weight to unlocking the higher tiers of buildings, and it's kind of exciting to save up enough to buy a wizard tower and then see your cookies per second number jump way up as soon as you buy it. It really feels like you're accomplishing something, even though it's just a pablum reward. And we can use points mechanics to do the same things in teaching and to adjust the pace of progress for beginning learners versus advanced learners but all within the same system. You can still have common standards and objectives, but with a system that's automatically responsive to where an individual is currently at, so you as the teacher can be intervening less to keep everybody on the same page. So like I said, these are just two out of many, many ways to think about using points and scoring mechanics to deliver feedback. We'll look at lots more games and more examples of points systems throughout the course, but hopefully this gives you a taste of the kind of game design thinking I want you to be picking up and being able to use to analyze games and interactive systems and criticize them as learning systems as well. So that's it for this part of the lecture. Next up is part two, where we'll be looking at achievements, badges, levels, and leaderboards, and how games create objectives and track progress in ways that persist beyond the immediate magic circle of the game itself. So I'll talk to you then.